Hello, beloved, and welcome to Women Ministry Leadership Summit. My name is Dr. Hannah Fuku Kolomainen with Further the Faith Ministry, where I fuse scripture, science, and story to fuel your faith. I'd like to welcome you to join me today with various other wonderful leaders and strategies for you to up your leadership quotient. Today, I am here to teach you five of those strategies. Please pray with me. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I want to give you glory and honor and praise for your presence in these women's lives and the work that you are doing in and through them. Lord, you are a God of strategy, and I pray that at this time, you will speak deeply into our souls and propel us forward for effective and fruitful ministry for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Welcome. And please feel free to write comments in the comment section. I will be attending to that and responding to them. And let's jump right in. Do you know that you are called to be fruitful and effective in your ministry? According to 2 Peter chapter 1, such a beautiful passage that I'd like to invite you to peruse at your pleasure and just soak in the beauty of leadership that God has appointed you to, strategically orchestrated for you to be in the position that you're in as an influencer. I have developed 15 strategies to find and fulfill your God-given mission. You, dear believer, have a God-given mission of leadership in women's ministry, and I thank God for that in your life. And my goal for you as a leadership and personal development strategist is that you would bear much fruit. Listen to this beautiful passage that I think speaks particularly to our role as leaders in women's ministry. It is from Psalm 144. And I'll just take a few excerpts. I've used this psalm in my book, Quit Wandering, 15 Strategies to Find and Fulfill Your God-Given Mission. Um, used this as a bedrock. And listen to these great passages. And I think you'll see yourself in this place. Praise be to the Lord, my rock, starts David. Who trains my hands for war, my fingers for battle? He is my loving God and my fortress, my stronghold and my deliverer. And it goes on to speak beautiful truths about our work that we get to do ministering to people. It ends by saying this. And when it refers to sons and daughters, I want you to think of the people that you lead. Then our sons in their youth will be like well-watered plants. Our daughters will be like pillars carved to adorn a palace. Our barns will be filled with every kind of provision. Our sheep will increase by thousands, by tens of thousands in our fields. Our oxen will draw heavy loads. Oh, I love that picture. There will be no breaching of walls, no going into captivity, no cry of distress in our streets. Blessed is the people of whom this is true. Blessed is the people whose God is the Lord. So as we jump right in, I picked five out of my 15 strategies that I call the Nehemiah leadership approach. And the five that we will look at today are curiosity, favor, what I call the PPRR approach to facing challenges. We will look at managing opposition. And lastly, we will look at how to handle the opposition and under managing as well as handling that opposition. So number one, curiosity. Curiosity is a wonderful trait. It actually is a very important aspect of executive brain function. And executive brain function is an important part of the soul. 
And as a women's minister, your goal is to shepherd the souls that God brings under your care and into your flock. So you, shepherd, can thrive and be fruitful and effective in your ministry to your lambs by being a curious shepherd. We start life off being very curious. Kids are curious people. Sometimes they're curious enough to make you pull your hair. I pray that you would be a curious shepherd. The book of Nehemiah starts with Hanani visiting Nehemiah. When Nehemiah inquires after how Hanani is doing, he does it in two ways. He asks how he is doing and how Jerusalem is doing. So as a minister, I would like to invite you to be curious about the people that you minister to. And we'll talk a little more about that here in a minute. And about the places that those people come from or are inhabiting. As an occupational therapist, I specialize not only in the person, in the occupation of that person, but also in the environment. Because an environment shapes a person and a person shapes their environment. So you can learn about a lot about the person or the environment by addressing one or the other. Look at this. He asks Nehemiah what is happening. And he immediately realizes that something is very wrong in Jerusalem, thanks to his curiosity. Now, Han and I had come to visit Nehemiah in, in Persia. Nehemiah could have said, I am so glad you're here with me now in this wonderful, glorious place. So I just want you to forget about your problems. I just want you to forget about Jerusalem momentarily. Kick back and have a good time, Babylon style. But that was not Nehemiah. When Nehemiah heard these words, he was cut to the quick. Hanani said, the survivors who are left from the captivity are in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are burned with fire. Heavy words that weighed Nehemiah down. And I want to invite you, dear sister, as a leader, to be a leader who is curious and who cares. I want you to marry your curiosity with caring. Do not be a callous leader. He could have showed him a good time. He, should have, he could have showed him what things are like in Babylon and how wonderful it is to be in this great position he is. But no, he reduced himself to the level of Hanani and desired to bear the burden that he was bearing. So God will bring to you, dear sister, People who are going through distress and people who are going through reproach. People whose walls have been destroyed and whose gates have been burnt down and are therefore vulnerable. The reason God brings these people to you is because they are a treasure. This treasure is now vulnerable. And God is entrusting it to you. You will not know that if you are not curious. So ask Holy Spirit to help you nurture a spirit of curiosity. Because God loves people. You must love people too. Because God cares for people. You must care for people too. There's a general attitude in the culture that I see today, that people are just a burden. Now, I am with you. People can be difficult. But we have been appointed to the positions that we have been appointed to. And we will be responsible and accountable to God for the people he has brought our way. So I want to bless you with the spirit of curiosity 
that cares about the people God brings your way. So put that top on your list of traits to up your leadership quotient. I know you're a busy person. I know you have many plates that you juggle. Curiosity will take you far in becoming a leader that people can relate to and people connect to. So that's point number one is curiosity. The second trait that I would like us to look at that has to do with leadership is favor. God has you in a position of leadership. And like I said, he has strategically appointed you to that position. Skill will be very important for you to develop so that you find favor with God, you find favor with those in authority over you, and thirdly, you find favor with those that you lead. Listen to this wonderful passage. It's Proverbs 22, verse 29. Do you see a man skilled in his work? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before obscure men. So we see the importance of developing skill in the work that we do. If you are to be fruitful and effective in your work, as 2 Peter chapter 1 calls us to be, we have to take this skill very seriously. And we have to pour our all into it and to nurture it so that we become great at it. In what ways are you investing in your skill? Your skill will open doors for you. Your skill will maintain your position in those situations. Your skill will make you powerful, effective fruitful in the work that you are doing with God's people. Find a way to grow in favor with God, your leaders, and your followers by being skillful at what you do. Invest time in increasing your leadership skills. Invest resources. Become the best leader that you can be. Be known as an amazing leader in your skills and in your position. Nehemiah was cupbearer to the king. And his prayer to God as he went to Artaxerxes, the king, needing a favor, was that God would give him favor with the king. Realize that it's his skill that had him in that position in the first place. The second aspect of this whole favor business has to do with your reputation. Guard your reputation. You build your reputation one day at a time. One experience at a time. Guard your reputation and keep it as godly as you can. Because your reputation wins you trust. It wins you trust with your leaders and it wins you trust with your followers. What's your reputation? What do people say of you? What do people expect of you? Nurture curiosity and nurture favor with those that you are privileged to lead. Ask God to give you favor with them. And an amazing way to do that is to grow in your skill as a leader. We read that passage and we saw that one of the promises there is that your oxen will bear heavy loads. We cannot be lazy as leaders. We can't rest on our laurels just because we've arrived where we think we need to be. Oh no, the work is just beginning, isn't it? That if you are going to have oxen that bear heavy loads, first of all, you have to have oxen. Somebody's got to feed the oxen. 
Somebody's going to house the oxen. Somebody's going to clean out and muck the stalls for those oxen. Leadership and responsibility are hard work. When others are sleeping and resting, you're up taking care of your oxen, inspecting your oxen. And you haven't even gotten to the heavy loads that they're drawing yet. It means you're farming other things or that you are a merchant of sorts so that you, these oxen, the best oxen in the land, mark you, are bearing the heavy loads that minister and serve others around you. That you are not only leading these people, but you are nurturing them, increasing them, trading them, making them the best they can be. That is part of your fruitfulness, your productivity and effectiveness in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, that you are spurring them on to grow in the faith, to grow in the likeness of Jesus Christ. Oh, may you grow in favor. Ask Holy Spirit to show you what areas in your life you need to nurture so that you can increase as Jesus did in favor with God and in favor with man. We've looked at curiosity. We've looked at favor. Thirdly, let us look at asking the incisive question, the ask. It is very important that you have a question on the ready on your mind at any given time. And my favorite question that I ask frequently of people above me and of people beneath me. Indeed, I ask it of myself. And here it is. What do you want? I love that question. It marks my counseling practice. I frequently ask people, what do you want? A lot of times, people don't know what they want. Or they don't know how to elaborate and explain what they want. The more concise you are at answering that question, the more fruitful and effective you will be. You can ask that question of your leaders. Sisters, you can ask that question of God. God, what do you want with me? You can ask your boss. You can ask your deacon board. You can ask whoever is in charge of the position that you run. What do you want of me? And the clearer we are about that, the clearer we are with what our role and expectation is. That is a question that you will ask people that follow you because you know that people come to you with all manner of problems and situations and happenings in their lives. As you get to listen to all those, as you get to support them in whatever their needs are, Ask the question, what do you want? So frequently, people have no idea what they want. They go on and on about what the problem is. And we'll see that as we go into the next section here. Hone people in. Focus them with that powerful question. What do you want? Number four. The PPRR approach to facing challenges. This is really important, sisters. The four letters, PPRR, represent pray, plan, report the problem, and request specific solutions. P P. R, R. I'll say it again. Pray, plan, report the problem, request specific solutions. So generally, this is how we do it. We pray very little. We plan very little. We report the problem a lot. 
a whole lot. Or we know the details of the problem. And then we hash them. And we rehash them again. And then we don't ask for a specific solution. We're pretty bad at that. Nehemiah, our master strategist, our role model and example, this man prayed a lot. This man planned a lot. This man reported the problem in a very concise manner. And then he requested a very specific solution. Do you see how we do that all kitty wumpus upside down? I pray that as a leader, you will learn how to pray for a good long time about situations that arise. That as a leader, you will learn how to plan for the question so that when you know what you want, you know what is needed to make it happen. Nehemiah wanted to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the wall. How specific is that? He didn't go on and on and on and about all these people who have been attacking the walls and breaking them down and burning the doors. He didn't go on and on about how discouraged the people were and how disheartened they were. You've heard this. You might be the one that's done this, that you go on and on and on and on about what the problem is. No, no more. The problem is succinct in your reporting of it, that you are able to very briefly and concisely express what that problem is after you spend an extensive amount of time praying about it, after you spend an extensive amount of time listing what it is that you want and making plans. Nehemiah knew that he would need to travel. He knew that he would need security to travel with. He knew that he would need permission and time off from the king. He knew that he would need a specific amount of time, and he calculated what that would be with the buffer, of course. He knew that he would need supplies. He would need timber. He would need men. He would need this extensive list. And he had that all prepared, so that prepared, I about said prepared, I really did. So that when you stand before the king and the king asks you, what do you want? Oh, that is your moment to shine. I would like master. I would like this and this and this and that. How long will you be gone? Because you have favor with your king and he doesn't want you gone too long that you're able to say, oh, I need approximately this amount of time. Oh, and I need favor from your connections. Oh, and I'm mm, well prepared, well prepared. And so I bless you with the PPRR approach. Let's jump as we finish here into managing opposition. You're going to expect opposition, and you're going to handle opposition. You are a soldier of Jesus Christ. You are at war. So you are to prepare and be equipped for opposition. If you're in the kingdom of God, every kingdom is marked by opposition because every kingdom has to maintain its hold and its dominance in the world. And the spirit world is no exception. And so moving forward, we will not be blindsided by opposition. Sometimes we're just utterly flabbergasted that anybody would oppose what we're doing. Listen to what happened to Nehemiah. This is chapter two. He, we haven't even gotten very far. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard about this, i.e. that they were arriving in Jerusalem to work, they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. As New Testament believers, we are the new Israelites. And your job, leader, is to promote the welfare of the Israelite. Your job is to facilitate the worship and the gathering of believers so that they can access God, so they can serve God. 
so they can please God. You better believe there's going to be opposition to that. It's interesting to me that Sand Ballot, the Horonite, is a foreigner, and Tobiah is a Jewish person. You will have opposition from the inside, and that will shake you because that's the last place you expect opposition. You expect it from the outside. But we are not to be foolish. We are to be wise as serpents and gentle as doves. Do not be ignorant and think that you may not have opposition from within. I encourage you, even as Nehemiah did, to know that God is sending you on a mission. God is using you in this mission despite opposition and that you need to become a master at handling it. I go to great length in my book, Quit Wandering, to outline what to expect, how the opposition attacks you in various ways, and how you are to rise up and handle that opposition that they lob at you unjustly. Lies, intrigue, so much work and activity being done sometimes to bring you down. Believer, I pray that you would be awake, alert, alive, enthusiastic to the truth that God desires to use you powerfully and for you to be effective and productive in your ministry. I want to read that passage that we started with again, and I want you to see yourself in it, dear sister so that you can see the work that he is calling you to in a new light and see his support of you in it. These are the excerpts from Psalm 144. Praise be to the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war. That's what your leadership position is. Who trains your fingers for battle. So detail-oriented. As an occupational therapist, I love the hand and the extremities and the amazing work that they do. God trains you to the minutia to be effective and productive in your work as a leader. He is my loving God and my fortress, my stronghold and my deliverer, my shield in whom I take refuge, who subdues peoples under me. Then our sons in their youth, your sons in their youth, will be like well nurtured plants. Your daughters will be like pillars carved to adorn a palace, beloved. Your barns will be filled with every kind of spiritual vision. Your faith will increase by thousands, by tens of thousands in your fields. Your oxen will draw heavy loads. There will be no breaching of walls, no going into captivity, no cry of distress in your streets. Blessed are you because this is true of you. Blessed are the people whose God is the Lord. Psalm 144. I bless you. I bless your ministry. I pray that you would grow in strategy. I pray that you would grow in wisdom, grow in curiosity, grow in favor, grow in facing challenges, grow in the ask, and grow in managing opposition to the glory of Jesus Christ. And God bless you.